is Coach Keita Bussey with 180 Firearms Training Podcast, accompanied today by Grant Chancellor Madison from South Africa, Mike Seifert from New Jersey, and Andy Stockwell from Texas. Today, we are going to talk about the Train Smart Advanced class for 180 Firearms Training. Grant took the very first class that I ever put together in South Africa. And Andy took the most recent one, the first time we had the two-day class with a PowerPoint and a workbook and all kinds of stuff. So Grant, why don't you, oh, I'm sorry, Andy, why don't you introduce yourself first? Tell us a little bit about you. Hi, uh, I'm Andy Stockwell. Uh, been shooting since 2019, uh, mostly compete in IDPA, have started rolling into some USPSA locally. Division? Started taking <laughs> what, yeah what division you shoot you know like uh, oh right right now i'm shooting uh carry optics uh in both divisions and uh going to be shooting uh decided to start shooting some ccp and idpa as well so just the different round counts and <clears throat> changing things up a little bit it was time to do it so i'm uh, gonna go start that route right now all right cool so grant can you start us off by telling us, tell, tell our audience what happened in South Africa, because this class did not exist when I got there. Well, no, it didn't. So we, we finished Okita's um, two day movement class um, and you went to go test out the beach in Cape Town. But uh, a couple of the guys here, we really wanted, we wanted more because we didn't have you for very long. And it's not like we can just hop over to the US to get a another class so while you're here we needed everything that you've got so we started pushing you for an advanced class and i believe on the uh, the flight you kind of there was a two-hour flight between cape town and joburg you pulled out an advanced class and uh, we organized you a range and everything you needed and yeah we showed up now it was interesting because when i showed up to the range i was told i'm not allowed to go to that range over there I had to stay far away from it. So I couldn't see the uh, surprise stage that you had set up, um, <laughs> which was, that was, that was quite interesting. So finally get my turn, walk up to the surprise stage. And I was like, you have 30 seconds, go. Like, go do, okay, okay, fine, I'll do. And then I had you just a very limited time to walk through it. I didn't know what was going on. Luckily, all my bags were loaded. Um, and then, you know, I had to shoot the stage basically blind and that was the first time i'd ever done that sounds like an ipsc match you know you got 30 <laughs> seconds to look at it for one time and then there you go <laughs> basically yes basically yes so yeah i shot the stage i i did leave a target um which was the whole point of the exercise so yeah kita also broke down quite a lot that you know we'd never even considered like the, the performance bubble and stuff like that um the thing with the timers was really cool. The trying to get the reaction time that was that was really um, eye opening. And then um, the kamikaze drill was pretty demoralizing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and, Andy, you've obviously you've obviously done that one. Um, yes, because yes. <laughs> the prize was the hat. I wanted the hat, man. Um, <laughs> I really uh, maybe that. maybe so, like, maybe one maybe one of you can explain to me. I thought what you just said was kind of, what what is a performance bubble when you say you're enhancing your performance bubble? What are you talking about? Yeah. With that? Well, Grant, what is your perception of it? What did I explain to you in your class? Okay, well, basically, it's a case of where you set your where you set your goals at a match. So, if you set your goals just to win and something goes wrong, you're probably only come second or third. So, if you set your performance goals higher than just scraping the barrel of winning if something does go wrong you're still higher above the person who's going to come second so, so shoot for the stars and if you miss you're still pretty high is that is that the goal pretty much you know? yeah you don't want to just win the match you want to dominate the match is that what you're talking about you want to win yeah. by a margin <laughs> yeah yeah okay. yeah and it's and that's what she had us do as well you know as far as performance bubble it was it was finding our 100 percent at what we run at individually and then working to dial that back for the match. You know, we go in and train. Kita through the class, he, the entire class was run till the wheels fall off, run till the wheels fall off. And that's, and that's what we were trying to do with our training 
and then dial that back for match in the match mentality as we're as we're getting closer. So uh, that's what we've been been working on. And the kamikaze drill, um, we'll do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if I've ever like dialed it back. Actually, you know, I always just try to run with the, until the wheels fall off on every match. So maybe that's part of my problem. So maybe I got to start working on that. All right. So Grant, what else? What else do you remember from that class? It was one day. I it was literally one day, wrote the very long time on the ago. plane on the way there. Um, I did write notes. Anyway, the stuff that wasn't in your book, you did discuss, um, but it was a long time ago. So that's basically the, the main the main takeaways I have from that. Also, shooting a PCC on the Kamikaze tool is easier than, than a handgun, FYI. Um, <laughs> well, PCC is just easier than everything, you know? It's a, it's a cheater division. <laughs> basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I, I walked away with that with a, with a better understanding of um, where I needed to set my set my goals and how I need to win matches. So yeah, that's, that's what I remember. There was probably a lot more. Um, uh, what but... about when I had you guys mess with each other? Oh, the mag thing. Oh yes, yes, yes. The mag thing. Well, um, yeah. So basically Kita had us give our mags to, to someone else and have them load them with whatever they wanted. So empty, em it, you know, we still had to shoot the stage, but now you don't know how many rounds are in your mag. You don't know if someone's put a shell casing in your mag or if someone's put a dummy round in your mag or if someone's loaded two rounds in the mag that you start with and now you need to shoot an array of three targets. So it was also a case of if things go wrong, are you going to just sit and scream and, oh no, it's messing up, or are you going to actually fix the problem? And continue shooting, shooting the stage. That was also pretty interesting. So I forgot about that. I it was basically a mind. malfunction clearing drill, and then you have to get back on your plan, and it brings yeah. pressure to your practice. So Andy, in your class, I had to mess with someone's mags because we had an uneven number. That was me. What? Yeah, you, you <laughs> messed with my mags, and you didn't do anything to them. So thanks. <laughs> So what did I do? I like that. You, I I had I ended up, you know, I brought a bunch of dummy rounds. That was part of the curriculum. You're like, if you can bring some dummy rounds. So I brought those and odd number, you ended up with my mags. I handed you dummy rounds. You handed me back a mag and I went and ran the stage again. And all of a sudden everything worked. Everything worked. So it was trying to keep that mental uh preparedness for the malfunction um but it never happened oh, so you were shooting expecting a malfunction on the, the very <laughs> next round and on the next that, round, on the next interesting round. that's interesting yeah, that, i did that in my RO class that was the same thing that happened in my RO class so george george would tell people like you know okay i want you to do this and this and then when he came up to me he told the guy to just do it right and i'm sitting there and i had made so many wrong calls on that because i'm like expecting something wrong you know like when yeah. is the thing that's going to happen wrong so that, that's a great drill actually i like that yeah, so, the best way to get in their head is for them to think something's going to happen and then nothing happens, but it's in their head the whole time and then to focus through that. Yeah, I ended up doing a reload in a weird spot and all kinds of different stuff. So because it, it, I got through the top half of the mag and it was a position change and I was like, I've got rounds in there, but I didn't need to do the reload. So I ended up doing a reload in a weird spot and... Yeah, it was it was a good challenge. It was good to to think about, um, you know. And that's one of the things you you and I had discussed before was mental preparedness getting into the match, uh, you know, even at at the at the first class. Um, and that's one of the things I've been I've been working on and and trying to get prepped for. So Grant, what did they do mm. to you? <laughs> I had more empty shell casing <laughs> in my mag than my rounds. I had about I think it was. <laughs> Three or four mags, and there were just shell, empty shell casings in all of them. So I was just—you couldn't even finish. You didn't even have enough ammo to finish the no, stage, I, did you? That would have been me. Yeah. I would have definitely set your mags like that. <laughs> no, I didn't even. I didn't even load. Like, what was the round count? It was something ridiculous, like twelve or thirteen or something. I was like, they didn't even load enough rounds for me to complete the stage. Over so I was like, ended up there. Yeah, all the mags were on the ground. They were all empty, and the gun was locked back. And I was just like, okay, well, I guess I'm, guess I'm done. Yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was, I, I learned how to run an empty gun very well there. 
So <laughs> basically what I did to create this class was as I'm sitting on the plane flying from Cape Town to Joburg, I'm thinking, okay, what training techniques have I used when training people to go to the world shoot who could potentially win training national champions in different countries? What have I done to train them? What training styles have worked? And then I created drills based on how the top guys train. And that was the entire class is this is how the top guys train. And these are the things they don't want you to know because yeah. they don't want you to beat them. So nobody teaches these kind of drills. I mean, I'm not going to say nobody teaches these kind of drills. I've seen, you know, malfunction clearing drills and things like that. But basically the entire class is managing your mentality and bringing pressure to your practice and how to push yourself and then dial it back and then doing some math. As yeah, well, well I mean, like, so, Andy, I got a question for you. I mean, Grant, national champion. What what class are you, Andy? I am a C class right now. Okay, so uh, do, do you did high you, C class? Did you feel like the did you feel like the techniques Tita was teaching with like, like what the pros do? Do you think that was helpful, or do you think that was a little advanced for you, or how did you feel about that? No, I think I think it was very helpful. I I I've worked to get to that point where I think it does help. If I was any lower, it probably not would not have been as effective, but, uh, right now it's one of those, I think that's something that I needed to help push myself forward because you can only go so far with your own skills without getting outside help. This is all there is to it. Um, and that's what I started doing here at this point this year. And, uh, so carry optics, I'm high C class 58%. So as we're going through the class, you know, I'm setting up these goals that that Keith is Keith is working through, and it's okay. I'm a high C class. I shoot a USPSA match about once a month, so my goal at this point is be A class in a year. You got to like get to that. B class. So goal for B class is six months. So we go through and we start setting those goals and getting them, uh, you know, lined up, ready to go. It, it, it's typical goal setting. Uh, but you got to have them written down and, and you're going to set the action steps, start getting those and making that progress. So I think everybody kind of knows that in their head, but having an outside coach come in and say, Hey, this is what you need to do. And actually give you, you know, I've got, I've got Keita's log right here waiting for the new book to come out. Um, and uh, just, you just got to work through it. And sometimes that refresher course on on the goal setting coming in and saying this is what you need to do is what you need. So I I was very appreciative of it and and hoping, planning and working uh, through the system and and looking for that A class in a year. So yeah, no, I was grand, for it, I think. grant in your class. What was the level of shooter who took the class? No, it was basically guys national champion level. Um, we had yeah, the other standard national champion. Um, the yeah, the, the production optics guy who's also national champion. We also had um, really top level shooters as well take your class and a couple of the open top shooters. So your class was basically filled with some of the top level shooters in South Africa. Um, and what so, did they take from it? What, what was the general consensus? Was it helpful, not helpful? Well, I can't speak for a mixed bag. I can't speak for them. Um, I like to think that they took quite a lot from it. Um, seeing how their their shooting has changed and improved since that class, I'd like to think this has helped dramatically. Um, you push the level higher in South Africa, definitely. Um, maybe that's a bad thing for me. So <laughs> maybe you can teach me a few things like on the slide there and we can hey, don't be <laughs> don't don't be selfish, you know. Other people being good too keeps you getting yourself better otherwise you get stagnant you right know? so i feel like that's the basically best thing that can happen is, but, to you grant you know yeah so but yeah i think everyone's improved um dramatically and also from what i'm seeing from the the shooting and that a lot of the stuff that is international is now starting to be incorporated at the at the level here so a lot of the international movement and international entries and exits is actually starting to make more of an appearance and changing the game slightly 
um, here because it was kind of a little bit of a different sport before you came um, with regards to trigger, <laughs> trigger control and that. And I think that has actually, it started to change when you, after you left and now it's starting to, to become recognized and that. Good. Yeah, you guys needed to catch up with the rest of the world. It's hard yeah. being secluded like that. So Andy, in Grant's class, they didn't have a workbook. They didn't have a PowerPoint. It was a one day class. They had a whiteboard and we did a bunch of drills and mixed in classroom sessions. What was your class like that you took? How far have we come from that? Uh, well, we had, uh, like you said, we, we've got, I've, I showed it a little bit ago. We've got our, our workbook, uh, which I'm still waiting for my pages that are not in Russian. Um, so we, so we <laughs> I a, did send few, those to, you know. Oh, who, did you send them? <laughs> you send yeah. Them to, I'll reach out to him. Um, uh, had a workbook, had a PowerPoint. It was a good session where we, where we sat around and we talked. You know, there was there was a lot more interaction than there was with a, with the first one. You know, in a conversational setting because we were bouncing ideas off of each other on on taking what you brought to us and in, and incorporating that into our into the way we worked. Um, so there was it was it was pretty it was formal, but it was informal as we were as we were working working things up and working together. Uh, definitely had a team atmosphere in the improvement side. And then we got to the drills and it was, you know, let's see who whose throat we can cut while we're, while we're trying to do this. <laughs> yeah. I, I, always feel like, I always feel like you should have a, you should have a, a friend or a partner that's going to help push you like that too, that you're working with a team. Like I, I not necessarily PCC guys, because around me PCC is not very big, but like, you know, I have a few open shooter friends that we always are, are trying to push each other and work together about exactly. how we're going to plan stuff and, and do it. Um, honestly, because I don't care if they beat me if they're shooting open, so they should beat me. But I mean, I feel like, you know, us working together and it's going to make us both better. You know, the way I'm thinking about it, the way he's thinking about it, um, you know, we kind of compare ideas and then, and then try to come up with one solid thing to do. Um, yeah. A big part of pushing people is pitting one person against another. So that is a technique that I've used in the train smart classes. Okay. I need to push this guy he can do more than what he's doing right now so i'm going to pit him against this other guy and i'm going to get in their heads a little bit and make them work for it so your your whole thing is you're pushing people outside of their comfort zone a little bit right is that what exactly you're... yeah because i feel like Did a lot of people that, get locked Andy? in they get, they oh, get yeah. locked into that comfort zone you know and then they never yeah. get better so and and, and that's and, and that was definitely you, you definitely reached outside the comfort zone to push um you know I don't know if we can use names, but I'm going to Wade and myself. We were, we were pushing each other and we're still doing it. You know, uh, going back to the kamikaze grill, grill, kamikaze drill. <laughs> um, it's about lunchtime. So <laughs> um, he's run it a couple of more times since, since the match. And he's like, Hey, I ran this in, you know, whatever he did it at that point. He's like, all right. So now I got to go do it again and push that and push myself through the, through that and uh, catch up to him. So we've got a couple of guys and shooting in central Texas, we've got a bunch of good guys in the area and we've all always kind of pushed each other um, in that level. We've always set something, you know, Oh, Hey, I'm getting closer to, you know, whoever I'm, I'm running against that point. And running through Kita's class and having several of those guys in, in the class with me, we're able to push ourselves even more now and start looking at, at getting some of the, you know, catching up some of the, to the, uh, you know, masters he, and GMs that we got in the area. Nice. So Grant, yeah, do you, you feel you that gotta... I was pitting you against one another to challenge you? Yes, especially at the kamikaze drill. <laughs> All right, what is this kamikaze drill? We keep hearing about it. Are you going to disclose what that is, Kita? Or are we okay. not going to? Is this well, like a secret that you have to take a, the class for? What well, is this kamikaze it's a, drill? It's, it's, a, it's a play track with five plays, and you've got four positions, and you have to use all six the plates. positions. There's six so, plates. So you shoot, shoot, you're at one, you okay, shoot was, the plate, run to another one, shoot another plate, run to another one, shoot another yeah, plate. Yeah, but you have to, you can't just go back and forth. You have to use all the positions. So, and like, well, you don't have to use control. all the positions. Yeah. You just can't repeat the same movement over again that you've already done. So you actually have to stage plan it. 
Yeah. Well, my stage plan probably wasn't the greatest because it took me until the third try to actually, no, fourth, fifth, fourth. Anyway, the four, I, the I four failed, times the charm, Graham. You know, the I, I failed a bunch of times to get it. I don't know how you. And found then it, Andy, <laughs> I was. I so was here my... I am, a B class shooter, teaching a class full of national champions, and they can't complete this drill. Yeah, we. So were after giving them a few sticks. runs at it, they said, "Oh, you're coaching. You this do it." Impossible. And I was like, "Okay," <laughs> and I did it. And they're like, "Oh man, we all just got yep. beat by a little blonde girl." <laughs> Yeah, well, I also want to say a little blonde girl who borrowed a gun and borrowed a rig when she came here. So that also that that also kind of like like put it in there. That Rub like we salt all in the wound a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so then after that, we 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 managed to do it because we thought it was okay. It's doable. So maybe the whole pushing us thing. I mean, it it, it we we were still trying to like let's do it quickly, you know. But so what what is, they had to learn was shooting mode versus moving mode, switching gears between moving as hard as you can between positions and visual patience in the position. Once they learned that, they were able to complete the drill. Nice. Yeah, once, I just wanted to, once, touch, I just wanted to touch on that. something you just said. Uh, I know we had said, Andy said he's a C-class shooter and you just said you're a B-class shooter. It does not matter what class you are. It does not matter what letters are next to your name. If you know what you're doing, you know, don't don't ever doubt anybody's ability or anybody's knowledge based on what that letter is next to your name. Anybody, you can learn anything from anybody. Um, so yeah, I, I find a couple of people are like, well, if they're not GMs, it's pointless to learn it. But I think that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard because just because they're not GMs doesn't necessarily mean they don't have something to offer. You know, so I think that well, uh, that's it. Puts, also puts some of the best some of the best coaches in the world have never participated in the sport that they are coaching. So think about that for a minute. Our sport is just in its infancy. So the perception is that it has to be a GM because they can't think outside the box, which is actually not outside the box in every other sport. They have coaches and we need coaches. Yeah. So, yeah. so Andy, how long, how long did it take you to complete the kamikaze draw and did Kita like show you guys off by doing it and make it seem easy? Uh, she, I'm, I'm curious. She did, she did do it. Um, but she was still recovering from her, her accident at uh, getting uh, shot. <laughs> yeah. Getting shot. Um, so it wasn't real quick, but she did do it. I think she did it 28 seconds or something like that. And, uh, I finally got it done. I think it took me five times. All I know it's, I know it's, 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 Keto was like, this is the last time. Stop. You're not doing any more. So I was like, great. So I've got to get it done here. And I finally got I it done. I say that to put on the pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I finally got it done in 19, 1907, I think is what we, what we. I like, what I, I like, I like, I like comparing times. I like going fast. So that would be, be a big challenge <laughs> for me. And then if somebody beat my time, I'd ask if I could go again. <laughs> yeah. There's well, something also, like, new. It took a while for me. I was like, eventually, it was fine to get dark as well mm -hmm. by us. I was like, he was like, yeah. okay, this is the last time. I was like, damn it. All right. And then I managed to do it on the last time as well. So there's obviously something. I, maybe I work well under pressure. Wow. Maybe that's, that's interesting. Maybe that's the thing. So it's Andy and Andy. You have and, to make uh, the decision. Grant. Yep. Both on the last time when you say this is the last time you got it. They both nail it. Maybe there's something to that. There yeah. is. It's Part so, of my manipulation so, tactics. <laughs> what, so what? Well, so how can I use that to tell myself before a stage? Like this is should I say this is the yeah. only chance you have at this? And like, or should I put a lot of pressure on myself? Is that what you're telling me to do? <laughs> well, it's kind of like when you have a reshoot and you have to shoot it like it's the first time you're ever shooting the stage and let yeah. go of whatever you did the last time. It's that yeah. same sort of mindset. Would love to figure out. Yeah, if we could talk about reshoots, maybe not on this cat, maybe on another podcast, but like I am terrible at reshoots and I've tried to like, I'm going to shoot them right away. I'm going to, I'm going to wait till they go last. I like, for some reason, like I get it so built up in my head on that first stage on the first time I run through it. And then once it's over, it's like, it's such a, it's like a mental flush. Like, okay, I'm done with it. Now you're going to tell me I have to reshoot it. So it's like, I got to restart that whole process to build it back up again. And for some reason, reshoots never work out for me, unless that's just a oh, reshoot guys in and general. Champs, I had a reshoot, I had a better shoot the second Did time you? around than first one. Yeah, now, so. is that is that is that like a normal for you? Do you do you yeah. normally do better on a reshoot? Usually, my reshoots are better. Oh, God, I wish. I'm so jealous. <laughs> Can we get some of that mojo our direction? Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So another big change in the new Train Smart curriculum is I've incorporated a lot of 
vision training from the research by Joan Vickers and also the right eye vision training. So Andy, what was the vision training like? The vision training that you had us do, um, basically, I think it was five targets. The, the, the part that I really remember is the, uh, what'd you call it? The, the, it was just, a, it was an advanced quiet eye drill. Yeah, and I, you had a name for it. I don't remember what it was, but we had white targets set up out, uh, you know, 15 yards. And even before we shot any of them, you had us just line up. And every time you'd hit the, the, the buzzer, we'd have to move our eyes, then have our gun come in on, on the, on our eyes. Um, oh, this was, was the lift and snap drill. The lift and snap drill. Yeah. The and transition that, drill. So yeah, the transition drill, but that worked into the quiet eye for me with getting on, on target and then having the gun come into, uh, come into the vision instead of tracking. And that's, that's what I, rem that's what I remember. Yeah, so what, do you mean, Grant did the, what do you mean quiet eyes though? I don't get it. What do you mean? Like divine quiet eyes for like loud eyes? Is that like the opposite? Like what is that? <laughs> <laughs> quiet eye just means it's, you're not jumping around between a whole bunch of focal points over a big space. You're, it's basically aim small, miss small. Okay. So your eyes are not moving all over the place. They're much more still or quiet. That's what it's not it like, it's not it's, like leading, leading with your eyes. It has nothing to do with it or anything, but like, no, it's, um, you don't want your eyes to be jumping around a lot. So if I tell you to take in the image of my hand, yeah. your eyes automatically are going to jump between all different focal points all over my hand. If I tell you instead to look at this spot on my hand, your eyes will still jump around, but it's in a much smaller space. So there's a lot less movement. Got it. Now the elite athletes who aim, this is weird and almost it seems almost superhuman. Their eyes don't jump around within that spot. They actually go straight to that spot. They may have one adjustment and then they move on. So they only have one or two focal points where we right. might have. So 20. you're, so, so you're not looking at the entire A zone or the entire down zero. You're looking at the A in the, in the A zone, right? Like you're trying to keep or it super small. Tiny like spot in that A, yeah. Yeah. So Got for it. the lift and snap drill, um, Grant, you did this drill as well. It was the transition drill, but now I have flipped around the targets to the white side as sort of training wheels to help you see the instant the sights begin to lift and transition off. Yeah, it just creates yeah. more contrast that way. Yeah, no, that it and it, it, look, the sights are black with a fiber optics, so it does help with that. Um, especially with when I was shooting forty back then, like the the sights lifted quite a lot. <laughs> So that, mm -hmm. was, that was pretty easy. Um, one of the things to stop yourself from doing is over thinking or before you pull the trigger, start to move, is don't do that. And that was the problem that I ran into quite quickly. After that, as in, instead of getting an A, I'd actually just drag it into the C or the Delta zone. Yeah, you had to so go the, sit in the timeout corner. <laughs> yes, I did. I did, have, I did have to go sit in the timeout corner. Um, and then I did also oopsie in the timeout corner by um, letting the wheels fall off and trying to shoot the transition draw a little bit too fast. And then he was like, no, because I was, because that wasn't how I was supposed to, I was like, oh, I've got, wheels are falling off. I'm like, no, just shoot how the sights are, shoot your sights. Shoot your sights. We didn't have a timeout corner, so I don't, I don't know what she was doing down there. That was just a grand thing. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, he was trying to do something on the drill that was not part of the drill. So I broke it down into something smaller, sent him to another bay and said, I want you to go and work on this for a little bit, then come back and we'll try it again. So he had to just sort of switch gears in his brain. Yeah. How many people, yeah, how but... many people were in your class, Grant? How many people were in your class, Andy? Like how many people seven? actually? Seven and then Andy? Yeah, we had seven as well. Seven. Well, we had seven on one day, and then one of the Eight guys. on the other. Up, no, we had six. Oh, Make, six on the other. Yeah. yeah that's that's one, great, though. One, one guy left, so. That's great, though, because then, you you know, you really get some personal attention from Keita, I feel like. You know, if there's only six yeah. people and you're there for a few no. days, it's, you know, you're going to get yeah, your money's not. worth on not feel like you were just, you know, 
just another person in the class. Dude on yeah, the I'm not going to line people. up 20 guys. It's not worth it. Yeah, You've that's got awesome. to have that individual attention. That's awesome. So what about um, the eye movements? Eye movement and moving targets, Andy. That, uh, I, I figured that's where you're going to go next. Um, we don't like small targets. Um. <laughs> Tell them what that means. So actually, Grant shot this match that I was telling you guys about when oh, I okay. shot the South African match, the Nationals. Uh, they had right, those one-third size, one-third scale. Match. <laughs> you did. So t describe to Andy what the swingers looked like. Yeah, so the swingers were basically, there was hard cover and like literally you could only see basically just the top of the alpha zone on the target. Um, it's, it's an Ipsic size, it's the Ipsic target. So you just see the alpha, a bit of a Charlie, a bit of the delta, and that's it. And they were fast. They were pretty fast and they were pretty far away. So and they was, were mini targets. Uh, I don't believe they were. They, they were used... so far away. They seemed... No, they did use was some mini targets where they had a mini target. as swingers. It was one Are those like those half size targets that you could see in like yeah. a, okay. like a right. full yeah, rifle? Was a, yeah, okay. Yeah, there was a stage yeah. or two where they did have the mini. It was a mini. It, so in Ipsic, you have to have all minis on the stage. And, you know, they did have the mini swinger. Um, same thing. But yeah, that. And then also. Maybe it was a mini, was a mini swinger? swinger? Oh yes. my God. That's Which crazy. means it's faster because there's less resistance. You're diabolical, Keita. Jesus. I want I, no, I didn't do that. That was it. That was at Nationals in oh South Africa. Yeah, that's a, did Shannon Smith set that match up? I would just like to know. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, she, it is totally a Shannon move. But it wasn't also she didn't do it to us in the class. class. So. Yeah, yeah. Andy, tell them, tell them what happened <laughs> at the class. So she, Keita, we're sitting there and, and Jason is, is the guy that, that runs the 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 club we were at and he comes up, he's walking up with his half size target. And we're all like, what the hell is he doing with that? So Kita sets up swingers where we're moving. She starts talking about swingers, how to engage them, tracking them. And then we run through a, a, a couple of different uh, drills to, to work on them. Yeah. To work on, on tracking. And then she goes out, pulls off the regular size swinger, puts up this half size, puts up more barrels to where we've got a gap like, you know, that Oh, big. my God. So you're making them shoot it at the fastest point. Oh, you are. A <laughs> we've, got to, at the height. we've got to shoot it at. So we're, we're <clears throat> moving. No, that was, the, that was with the regular one. Uh, that was after she sets that up. So we're we're ten yards away, twelve yard, ten ten yards away from the steel activator, twelve yards away or so from the from the half size target, and it's activate. See how many you can get on target with this mini mini, and it's just it's doing so she, this. She South Africa you. <laughs> I did. So I totally did. <laughs> and she was she was laughing the whole time too in the background you could hear it you could hear it whenever whenever you start the buzzer you, you could hear her laughing um but because i had to do it in a match at nationals <laughs> so now it's your turn <laughs> but most of we all got we all got uh some on target i think i, I actually got four out of five that i engaged yeah. on target um Nango don't make got, it easier for swingers do what dots uh, red dot sites make it easy oh, yes. yeah for sure and i think all oh, of us tight. Were, i think all of us had dots that day um couple couple were running open guns but most of or us were shooting optics or, yeah. yeah so it it did help but still you got this pass <clears throat> swinger moving and and waving at you every time it goes by it, it's <laughs> It's frustrating. So, so I did. Uh, yeah, it was a good drill. And then we ran through and we actually did afterwards uh, to prove that we've been, you know, show that we've done some improvement. Uh, she had us shoot a regular size swinger on the move. So 
and uh, we all we all did really well on that. I think. All right. So, what happened with the vision training? It was eye movement for moving targets. So we talked about basically ambush versus tracking and using saccades, which is where your eyes jump between targets versus smooth visual pursuits where they're tracking along with the target. And if your gun isn't moving, you're late, all that sort of thing and covered the scientific details behind the vision. So we talked about shooting at the dwell, ambushing, tracking back versus shooting at the height of the swing versus between two barrel stacks where it basically appears and disappears, appears and disappears very quickly. So I had them start with full-size targets. They activated it and went straight to the swinger just so they could get used to how to track the swinger versus ambush the swinger and when to do which thing. So after they've done this, then I said, all right, well now we're gonna let the wheels fall off and you're gonna take two targets after activating. How did that go, Andy? Went well, actually. Um, showed, showed we, we were able to push that speed and, uh, you know, use that time effectively as we're waiting for the act for the swinger to come out after the activator. Runs. I see, I see that all the time. You know, I, I hate when people shoot the activator and then sit there and wait for the swinger. Like you, it takes mm -hmm. like a second to, for that thing to fall down and come out. And now you're, you know, especially me, when you're behind the dot or you're behind the gun, that second feels like it's forever. So like, you know, there's gotta be also, something else you can do there. Yeah. We also talked about hit factor and how many passes of the swinger you're going to allow yourself and making that decision before the stage so you don't go to war with it. <laughs> and, and actually one of the, one of the best things that you, that you said was while you're doing your prep work on the swinger, don't watch the swinger for the first couple of times. This rolls back into, you know, how many times you're going to look at it. Uh, if you're, you know, watching it the first couple of times, don't, and that's when you're going to engage it, don't watch it after that because you get your timing off in your mental preparedness. So uh, that's one of the things I've really been trying to do uh, whenever we've got swingers or uh, other movers. It's, okay, so this, this is one, two, that's the speed that I'm going to engage that at. I don't look at that swinger again afterwards. That's smart. Because you I have don't, to learn I don't to match the that. speed yeah. with your eyes. Your eyes that. have to match the speed. Yeah. So I don't want to have <clears> that, <throat> that slower speed in my brain when I'm trying to do my visualization. <laughs> my match yep. So then I switched it out for the mini swinger and had you guys shoot that so that when you go to a match and you see a full size swinger, you're like, huh, I got this. I can do this. And then to prove that to you, I had you shoot the swinger on the move. So as far as footwork, including that into this class, it was more, what, what did I say, Andy, about the footwork? Footwork was really more the first class and trying to, you know, work that integrated already. Uh, you kind of expected us to come with that, uh, some of that work done, already done. Uh, so we, and I think, I think we all did. I think uh, everybody that was in the class had really improved their footwork since I, I think I took the class in June. I know it's one of the things I've been working on. Wade's been working on. Uh, there's been several other, uh, Nando. Uh, we've all been, been working on that and trying to get in and out of positions quicker. Um, and we didn't, we did worked on some. I think there was footwork was really more in this class was more involved with entry and, and exit uh, and setting up in positions uh, and making that transition from moving mode to shooting mode. Uh, I think that was where more of the footwork came in. It was more the application of what you already learned and giving me an opportunity to see how far you've come with your footwork. But I did give little bits of feedback here and there on footwork itself. And what did you learn about position entry and how long that takes you? For Do you remember me, that? Well? 
<laughs> uh, yes, the 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 run over and slap and the run over and shoot. Um, so whenever we started timing that out, I think we what do we do? Twelve yards, something like that. Um, we time we timed our movement from position to position, and then position to uh, gun up and then uh, shooting and takes me about a second at this point uh, from an added second to getting stopped and getting the gun up to where I'm ready to shoot. See, that doesn't uh, sound right to me. I, see, that the way you said that sounded wrong. You should never stop and then get the gun up. I feel like the gun should be up. I, and that's, and that's, you know, that's one of the things that that's part of it. More, that's part of it. It's part of what I got to work on. And that was, the, okay, so we're coming in. Why do why do I not have the gun up higher, ready to go? Um, yeah, aiming and, at the target through the barricade. Yeah. So, yeah, so this gave them the new, numerical values. How long yeah. does it take you to set up and hit a steel plate at 15 yards or whatever it was? Okay, well, now you have something measurable. So now you can do it again and see if it's improved and tweak things. Okay, I need to have the gun up sooner. I need to control my entry a little bit more, come in lower, take smaller steps, whatever it may be, and see if that time goes down consistently. I, I like the way she just put in all three things I need to work on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially for, PC, lower, for PCC. Yeah, well, for PCC, I mean, the, the entries and the exits are huge, you know, because it's, it's a lot of mass that you're trying to get in and out of the spot. So, like, you know, like, to me, that's that's one area that I focus on a lot is, is is that, my footwork and my entries and my exits and trying to be smooth with it. But, I mean, you guys are all pistol shooters, so you don't really have to deal with that and same this, thing that I do. But This drill actually gives you numerical values for that, so you know if you're improving, you know how long it's taking you to set up in a position. So is it going to be better to try and shift your weight through versus setting up? Usually, yeah, especially with a PCC. Yeah. Well, but what else we got here? Well, it says here, I'm reading your curriculum. It says contingency plans. So I'm interested, like, what is it? Is that like an audible if something goes wrong or doesn't go to your first plan? Are you supposed to have like a backup plan or what is a contingency plan? Grant, did you do contingency plan drill in I your class? I don't recall that. I don't remember if you guys did either. I don't think we did. No, you, and see, this is the thing that people don't understand about your class is that it's always evolving and you as a shooter are always evolving. So you kind of, you always need to check in and take the class again. And I'm actually looking forward to taking your advanced class again, because it just sounds like it's awesome. But yeah, you just need to keep taking the class every once in a while to learn new things. Um, so yeah, what contingency plans? Here to go. <laughs> contingency plans, good or bad? Yes or no? A contingency plan is when you have your plan of how you want things to go, but if this happens, then I will do this. So you have this other plan in the back of your mind that you might need or you might not need. Kind of like when you had your non-malfunction clearing drill, you had this plan in the back of your head and thinking, oh, I'm going to have to reload. And so you did, but you didn't need to because it's hard to balance that contingency plan. So if you're going to use one, there are reasons to use one but you have to keep it really simple. So Andy, do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> whenever we ran through it, uh, we really focused around steel. Uh, if you have a, a steel, an activator, um, especially if you're low in, you know, low round count uh, or low number of rounds in the mag, whenever you're, whenever you've shot at it, do you take, you take that extra shot. Do you do a reload before you take the shot on it, just to make sure that you're you've got enough rounds in the gun to engage that activator uh, in in a feasible manner. So that's kind of really where we talked more about contingency plans, um, and that's something that I think is is really good. You've got you've got to have that in your brain at least a little bit or well so you're, gonna, so you're so you're like a, you're low cap people this is where i feel like you guys need more contingency plans so you're so <laughs> what you're what you're explaining to me is like so if you got to run through four papers and then get to a get to a steal 
And then God forbid you had to shoot an extra one on paper or something like that. Maybe you take that, that steal from another position because now you shot too much. Is that like what's in your head? Like, Oh, if I go one for one on these targets, then I can take two shots of this deal and be fine. Or uh, like, yeah, is that- and, and you've, you've got to look at this stage and, and see if it's, if it's engageable in another position as well. That's, that's part of that contingency plan uh, as you're, as you're bringing it up. It's like, okay, so I've shot at this and I need to keep moving is there another position that I can engage either the swinger or the steel or whatever you're, you're shooting at from another position where it, you don't blow your whole stage plan out of the water. Uh, well, this sounds really awesome for Epsix because we only got 15 round mags in, uh, in production. So if it's a 14 round stage, a contingency plan, we can go 16 rounds on the gun. See, how do you feel about that though? Like, would you, so Akita, this is a question I got for you too. So like if the, if the stage, now I don't ever worry about this. I got 53 rounds, but um, like if you have a 24 round stage with a 24 round mag, like, are you, are you, do you think it's slower to not reload? Like to me, I would rather just blaze it and throw a reload in somewhere. To me, there's always a spot to reload on a stage. You have to run from somewhere to somewhere, unless you're standing in a box, which then you're doing a 24 round set. It'll probably like, would you try to go one for one and shoot slower so that you don't miss? Or would you uh, try to just shoot like you shoot and do a reload? That's the thing. Let's say we have a 24 round stage, right? And I'm trying to, well, Carry whatever it me. might be. I'm, you're trying to go one for one, right? No reload. So you have a steel in one position. It's available again at the end. That's the one you're really concerned about because it's maybe a tough steel and all the other targets are pretty close range. You're not too worried about them. So you shoot your stage, you take a mic on that steel. Now you have to run forward, but the steel is available later on. You weren't planning on doing a reload, but now because you need a makeup on that steel, you're gonna do a reload, run forward, clean up that last steel. So you and, would you would never, you would just <clears throat> try to go one for one on that kind of stage? Yeah, but so also if, I, the, if you, you're saying? I've done this, I've, I've done this in standard, um, uh, I haven't done it yet with, with production, but I've got 18 rounds in the gun. The stage is 18 rounds. So I can put Perfect. plus one. So I've got one, I've got one extra round. So it's kind of like, if I go one for one on the steel and the movement on that particular stage was if I throw a reload in and miss it, it could cost me a second. So if I don't throw a reload in, I could save a second. But did you feel so, like you were shooting slower because you knew you had the exact amount of rounds and you're trying not to get to a reload? That's what I'm trying to get at. Like, do you feel like you uh, slowed no, yourself down? Or the way, the way I, I ran the stage deliberately, maybe it was slower, but it, yeah. I ran the steel first. So if I run the steel first, get one for one on the steel, then I can just blaze the paper at the end. Roger that. So I've yeah, done that know. before to sort of rein in my accuracy. If I've been struggling with being really accurate in a match, then if it's a one for one stage, then that puts it in my head that, okay, now I have to get my hits and I actually shoot better. But for most mm-hmm. people, I don't think that's how you should do it. But if, if you can avoid a reload, you got to risk it for the biscuit. If you don't take any risks, you're not going to reap any rewards. And there yeah, will be a place where, yeah, but then you have your contingency plan. So you're not planning on failing. But you're planning you do, on everything going perfectly. So you'll but say, I'm going to go one for one. Happens, if I have to, I'll reload here, right? That's what you're exactly. getting at. Yeah, if I miss that plate, I'm going to have to reload here. So I think yeah. that's, exactly. yeah, that's a good contingency. Well, yeah. and that, that kind of, you know, it rolls over into that risk versus reward that we talk about or that Kita talks about as well as you're, as you're running this, you know, is, is, do you just take the mic on that steel? Is it worth the reload? You know, and got to start doing the calculations on that. Yeah. That's uh, where you get the calculator out. Yeah. <laughs> so I, no, I blew people's minds at Africa champs when everyone's still doing the walkthrough and I'm like with my calculator out in the corner, calculating the stage plan. And everyone's like, what, what on earth are you doing? I was like, well, yeah. I want to see if I take a mic on that one, if it's going to be faster. I was like, and what? So obviously this is still not common knowledge. Yeah, we got to do a whole podcast on match math. Maybe hopefully one day in the future we'll do that. You know, that would be fun. We will be doing match math. Yeah, <laughs> we will. All right. Very cool. Very That's cool. Coming. Yeah, love it. So, all right. Yeah, what else we got for the class? So actually it's almost time, isn't it? Uh, is it? We don't do these by. long these hours fly hour. by. I know. They do. By. Oh my goodness. So Andy... <laughs> Overall impressions. Overall impressions, it was a great class. 
uh, you know, we kind of, we sat around and talked about a, a couple of the drills that probably need to be moved to the first class. Um, because you guys were sort of my guinea pigs. It was the yes, first two exactly. days. We, we, were, we were guinea pigs. Um, yeah, so it was, we, man. It was, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> you, that's right. You two were both the first of both classes. So, so it, it, I think it was great. Learned a lot. Learned a lot in coaching myself as well, uh, which is something that I think everybody's going to need if you're going to advance. Um, and I'm I'm adding stuff to my to my book and my my notes and everything as we're as we're moving on. So, uh, oh, real quick, talk about the Excel spreadsheet. So one of the things that we that we talked about is uh, random training. Uh, drill training, rotating having, skills, yeah, rotating skills. And one of the things I'm, I'm working on is, uh, I'm going to try and work up an Excel spreadsheet and send over to her to randomize training with, where you can keep track of what you're doing and where things are, are happening and where you're doing your improvements, but it will be, it'll pull out random information, you know, random drills for you to run at a, you know, it, three times a week, five times a week, however, however time you want to, how many times you want to run it. That way you can keep recording, but you've got a, you've got something else actually generating the random randomization for you to where you're not running the same drill every single time. That way we can start improving those yep. skills and getting them in. So in the workbook, I give you guys a formula for randomizing your yep. training, randomizing your training plan and how to set that up. Also, there's a math, mathematical formula in there on finding your 100% dialing it back versus amping it up, calculating hit factor and how to use that to find your low hanging fruit to tell you which things need to be in your practice more often. And I give you the ratio, how to find the ratio of randomization. Yeah. And, and that'll all work in getting that incorporated as well, so. We'll have that set up. I want to take, I want to come take it. I'm the only one here that hasn't taken this class yet. And I want to come take it now. So the next time you're well, up you here, you got to take legal. the smart move class first. Oh, we got to do prerequisite. All right. I like that. Yeah. So prerequisite. I got to do some work then. So next time you're up here at double Eagle or something, I gotta, I'm going to be out there with you. So. Nice. Right. How about you, Grant? Oh, well, yeah. Impressions. Please, when you come to South Africa again, please run your uh, your new advanced class because I'm definitely going to be there. Um, when you when you go, please take me with you. I want to come meet Grant. I want to shoot in South Africa. That's all. I want to say. <laughs> well, by, by the looks of things, I'll probably come there first before you guys come down here. So, like, I'm working on something in May, but right. um, definitely, definitely need to, to take this. And obviously, I'm still getting the the, the coaching and that, and Keith is sending me some all the tools and and that, and we are working through the through the stuff so i'm 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 hopefully going to be a better shooter soon. <laughs> hey you said you're coming in may you got to let me know what match you're going to i don't care where it is in the country i'm gonna come there we're gonna we're gonna shoot together so we'll, we'll if you're going out towards wisconsin by where keith is then i will uh you know i'll make sure i get the trip out there if you're going to be on the east coast i think he's going to be closer to you actually yeah then uh, you, can, you can stay with me man i got a room for you you don't gotta even get a hotel so there you go sounds good sounds good yeah but, thanks so right. much andy for coming on no, thank you andy thank you that was awesome <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was, it was, it was great. Uh, it's fun class. Uh, looking forward to doing some more with you actually in the, in the future. Um, Grant, I hope to hope to see you meet you in person and shoot with you here. You know, before too long. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <agree>. Definitely. <laughs> okay, good, good luck with making a class. I'm pretty sure you're going to crush yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, man. Good Working luck, on man. it. I... So yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. All right. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Yeah. All Have the likes and subscribes. Cheers, Jess. <laughs> <laughs>